Hi everyone, greetings and welcome to your course two in the Behavioral Forensics Institute uh, Criminal Profiling Technician course. Uh, this is our second sort of talking head video, if you will. Uh, I realize that talking head videos can drone on a bit, uh, but sometimes they're necessary uh, to, to get through the orientation phase and we're still there. Uh, this particular uh, course is concerning uh, your professional development. Most of you who are in this program are not yet in law enforcement or defense intelligence profiling, but would like to be. And so we get a lot of inquiries at BFI about how do I get hired, what does a profiling day look like, uh, what's the difference between reality and TV, what's the difference between national intent pro intelligence profiling and behavioral profiling. And that's what we want to talk about today. And the format that we've selected is to pull the questions that have come in over email and off our, our phone bank and present those to you today. Uh, and again, this will be a very informal discussion. It'll be a lot like course one in that we won't edit, uh, edit this in any way. This is the way it would be presented to you in a classroom if it was just a lecture. Uh, from this point forward, course three and beyond, uh, there'll be more involvement by you, less listening, more doing. Uh, and uh, especially as we get our online platform stood up, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But before we dig into the professional development, uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some organizational aspects of BFI and the National Profilers Association. Uh, I'm doing that because the people who are, are inquiring now about uh, joining BFI or joining the profession have some pretty common questions. And I realize that if you're seeing this, you've already signed up, you're already attending classes, you're already making progress. But I thought still would address these things for you in case they were in the back of your mind somewhere. So we'll take a minute and address about seven or eight questions concerning organizational issues, and then we'll delve into the professional development side of things. Uh, one of the, the questions that we're asked frequently is, what is the relationship between uh, the National Profilers Association and the Behavioral Forensics Institute? People wonder, are they one in the same organization? No, they're not, uh, but we do share resources, we do share manpower, uh, and we hope that very soon you're going to see more and more of a separation as we have more senior volunteers come onto the staffs of both organizations, and then by 2016 we want to be in a position where the National Profilers Association officers are elected by the membership at large. Uh, we had to have a starting place with NPA just like we did with BFI, and that meant we had to appoint officers uh, to get started. Actually, NPA is the goal of BFI. Uh, we at, that are involved in this process, uh, and as you become more involved in this process, you'll, you'll see why, know that we need a voice as profilers within the various professions, whether they're law enforcement, military, or the intelligence services. We need standardization of our training. We need to set education standards that are achievable. We need to have mechanisms for members and students to access resources. And we need to pull all of this together in, in one place. And at the outset, an undertaking like this, and I've been involved in several of them in my own career as a director of, of research and a director of certification at Peace Officer Standards and Training Commissions or councils, whatever they're called in your state, uh, they're always rough to get off the ground, but they fairly quickly smooth themselves out and standardization becomes the norm and people accept it. Uh, people being leaders in the public and so forth. And so right now we're trying to uh, get NPA established as a professional association. We will very soon, we feel like, be merging with ISHTA, the International Society of Human Dimension Analysts. ISHTA was founded in 2005. Uh, it was a closed association in that the general public cannot join. Uh, they are primarily intelligence profilers, although there are a few uh, behavioral and criminal profilers uh, involved. And ISHTA has, has maintained a steady membership. Now we hope to merge the two. Uh, and that gives us a lot of experienced leaders and analysts and uh, profilers uh, immediately sort of as the core of NPA. There are some challenges there. Uh, the security clearances of the intelligence analysts 
uh, usually mean they're working very sensitive jobs. They can't have their name in a membership directory. They can't have their picture on a profile and such as that for obvious security reasons. Uh, so there are some challenges there. Uh, so, you know, one question we get is it sounds like BFI and MPA are, are new organizations. Um, yeah, they, they are. I, I think we've been pretty upfront with everybody about that. Uh, they're new in that they're an offshoot of ISHTA. And this is the attempt to merge all of those uh, different approaches into one. Uh, BFI will eventually be the subordinate academy to NPA. So we would like to be in a position where the BFI faculty, the, the uh, executive director, the dean, the program directors are answering to the officers of the National Profiling Association. And that makes sure uh, or ensures that standards are set according to uh, the trends, patterns, uh, wishes of the membership. Um, it also helps to make sure that we have a very diverse flavor uh, about the association and about our curriculum. Uh, obviously, the people who, who have been in this business a very long time, who have master's degrees and doctorates, few who have bachelor's degrees, many intelligence analysts, um, national defense intelligence profilers, have bachelor's degrees and that's their stopping point. Not all by far, but many of them. Uh, but there are a lot of people who have masters and bachelors, uh, excuse me, masters and, and PhDs who don't think that if you don't have those, who think that if you don't have those degrees, you shouldn't be in this business to begin with. Um, that's a debate for another day. Uh, you've seen a little bit about that on, on the BFI website, but eventually the membership will decide what the standards are for this profession. So you um, are groundbreakers. You're, you're on the ground, ground zero of this uh, effort and we're very pleased to, to have you as students. We're very pleased to have you as members of the National Profile Association. We're very proud to hear your voice. And we hope that we're going to be of such service to you that, this, that you will be happy um, that this is one of the things that you've, you've chosen to involve your life with. Um, we are dedicated to helping you find the job that you want. We are dedicated to helping you grow in that job. And uh, I hope that uh, many years down the road, I can look back and say, hey, a member of this particular class, right now I'm talking to class 1532, but this, this camera, uh, excuse me, this video will be on, online for future classes as well. I hope that a member of your class is the president of NPA. Uh, you've got a few years under your belt doing this type of work, and, and you look back fondly uh, as being what's called a plank owner uh, of, of BFI and, and NPA. Um, the grant award program sounds too good to be true. How can BFI afford to make this offer? That's a pretty common question we hear. And it, frankly, the, the grants uh, scare a lot of people off who would normally uh, sign up. They see it and say, uh oh, there's, this is some sort of an internet scam. The truth of the matter is we probably should have waited another six months or so before we stood up the online classes. But we, we need to go through the nonprofits uh, process. We need to find our weaknesses and we we found many and you've been good enough to offer your feedback to, so that we could correct some of those and I'm sure we'll find more uh, but we needed to have active students involved we needed to hear that feedback we needed to adjust our syllabus we needed to uh, determine how successful we would be not requiring college degrees to begin and so it was an ideal situation that we could offer this very expensive training for essentially no cost. Uh, a lot of students and potential students have wondered if there are hidden fees associated with the grants. It's almost like some students are sitting back waiting for us to let the other shoe drop, if you will. R rest assured, there are no hidden fees associated with these grants. Uh, a question that we have gotten in the uh, application process is, does F, uh, BFI and MPA have a refund policy? Uh, yes, the policy is simply this. Uh, if you're not happy, we'll see to it through one organization or both that your dues are refunded. We don't want anybody forced to be a member of either organization. Uh, this is an all-volunteer organization. Both of them are vo all-volunteer organizations in the sense that the staff and faculty, but also the students are. And if somebody's not happy, then we don't, we don't want to force you to stay here. Uh, so the policy is 
As long as you ask for a refund before completion of your third class, we'll provide you a refund. Uh, after your third class, we feel like you've gotten more than your money's worth. If you are having some sort of personal problem, let's say, for example, you're, you're unemployed and you can't pay your light bill and you just got to make a hard choice, then you call BFI and uh, ask for me, Dr. Russell Baker, and uh, I'll see to it that you get a refund. We know that many of the people that we're working with as students are unemployed, trying to transition a key point in their life. And we're public servants. Uh, all of us that are volunteering with BFI and NPA are career public servants who have given our, our lives and our families' lives, frankly, to serving the public. Um, and if, if you're struggling, we, we don't want to be a contributor to that. We want to be part of your solution through BFI and NPA. We don't want to be part of your problem. Do BFI students ever have to sign a contract? No, um, you don't and you never will have to. Even in our job placement services, uh, headhunting services, if you will, uh, we're student oriented. And if we get to the point, we'll talk about portfolios in a little while, if we get to the point where we're actually selling student portfolios to agencies so that employees can be hired, profilers, analysts, or technicians, uh, crime scene technicians can be hired, then that will be an expense borne by the employer, not the student. That's our hope. We're still doing some studies there. There's still some things to look at, but we'll talk about that in a little bit as we get into professional development. Uh, what are my sponsorship annual dues used for and what do they cover? Um, they're used to pay for things like printing, maintaining your, your transcript, uh, postage to mail out your transcript, the computers that are necessary to manage uh, those aspects of your career. And you'll also see that NPA is going to be offering some internships for people who are interested in actually getting a little real world experience. Um, in fact, I'm working a project personally right now that could use about 15 interns. Uh, and I will ask NPA to post that on, on that website. Uh, so your, your dues cover those sorts of everyday administrative things. Um, an $80 $80 in dues from a student for an annual uh, dues payment is not going to cover, obviously, the development of this course, the instructor's time. Uh, typical instructors make $250 to $350 an hour, so one student you know, isn't going to pay even an hour of instructor's time. That's why we use volunteers. That's why we're trying this, this very unique approach. Um, why do, why do the Behavioral Forensics Institute and the National Profilers Association not have a more prominent internet presence? We don't want one, uh, very simply stated. Uh, typically, internet, uh, excuse me, uh, websites are picked up through Google, Bing, other, uh, other search engines, through SEO optimization, it's called. It's a, a process of using keywords to have your site recognized. We don't use any of that. We don't use AdWords. Uh, we are going to remain an invitation only association and faculty. We're not going to open to the general public. We uh, obviously did for the pilot program and, and the next two classes will also be pilot programs. Beyond that, uh, there's not going to be any public notice. We don't want to turn into a vocational school where just anybody comes in off the street and you know they have a felony conviction or something like that and, and we have to take them in regardless. We're interested in training practical profilers, intelligence analysts, and uh, uh, crime scene investigators. We are not interested in becoming a diploma mill or just graduate, graduating everybody that walks in the door. Uh, our courses right now for the profiler uh, programs specifically are not as intense and as thorough as they will be uh, because we're in the testing phase. Uh, we don't have educational requirements right now for the reasons that you heard me talk about in course one, but I can well imagine that the NPA will eventually determine standards have to be such and such for the different levels. Uh, and so it's very wise of you to, uh, to get in early on this and to continue your formal education if you're going to school so that you can advance um, as quickly through this process as you can uh, in your career. Now, I'd, I'd like to make one point about the courses, uh, and that is that you have paid your annual dues. 
uh, through MPA. You can take as many courses as you can complete in that year of membership payment, your dues payment. So if you finish the uh, Criminal Profiler Technician course, National Intelligence Profiler Technician course, and you want to move on to the other programs, we're going to welcome you to those of you that are in the pilot programs. Uh, future students will, of course, have to, to pay for each program. Uh, but those of you that are tolerating us as we're growing, as we're learning our way around the online education community, because frankly, we're, we're all profilers. We're not IT people. Uh, we're not professional online university people. Most of us have taught college. I mean, I've taught several, several different college courses at different colleges, but uh, my online uh, university presence has been uh, limited to that of, of simply a professor. Now we're developing all of that for you, and we're developing it in such a way that it's customized to you. So we understand that you're having to tolerate uh, a little bit of our growth, uh, our growing pains, and we appreciate that. And one way that we can uh, sort of pay you back for that is to let you to take those other courses uh, at no charge. So I would encourage you uh, to take as many programs as you want to take. We may not develop them as fast as you'd like, but as we bring on more and more volunteer instructors and faculty, courses will be developed more quickly. But first, we have to, we have to run these pilot programs and, and pull in a few statistics. Who exactly does BFI train? Right now, BFI does train the general public. Uh, I think we covered that quite a bit in, in course one, so we won't get into any, any uh, detail there. But uh, if you have people in your family or friends that you know that are interested in a career, in law enforcement, the military, the intelligence services as a profiler, then now's the time to send them in this direction. You'd, you'd be doing them and us both a favor. Uh, what are the professional certifications offered by BFI? They're all featured on the training overview page. Uh, you can take a look at those. There's, there's three different levels of, of profiler. There's three different levels of uh, law enforcement and corrections intelligence analyst. And then there's two levels of crime scene investigator. Uh, I thought one had to have a PhD to be a profiler. Uh, I think we've talked about that several times now. Uh, some profilers do have PhDs, uh, as we talked about in course one. Some profilers are forensic psychiatrists who are medical doctors. Some are psychologists. Uh, and so there's a wide range there across the various professions. What is the difference between a national intelligence profiler and a criminal profiler? A national intelligence profiler works within the military system or the intelligence services systems. When I say intelligence services, I mean civilian intelligence services, and uh, develops human targeting packages or, or does cultural behavioral studies or, or those sorts of things. Uh, the, here in the United States, well, in, in Europe even more so, the influx of uh, refugees and, and immigrants uh, who are fleeing the situation in the Middle East our, our almost open border situation in the United States means that we have, we're soon going to have, uh, and to some extent are already experiencing a clash of cultures, but we have to have profilers that understand all of these different cultures. And if you go to work as a national intelligence profiler working for, say, the military, you will be assigned to a specific part of the world. And the best profilers are the ones that stay there and make their career in that one part of the world because it takes a very long time to learn a culture and if you're not a native speaker if you weren't brought up in that culture uh, you can spend your entire career learning about that culture and you still won't know all the, the nuances. Uh, what is a typical career path for a profiler analyst or crime scene tech? Uh, in all three cases well that's not quite true uh, let's start with the profiler. Uh, in the case of the profiler most profilers uh, start out as either street law enforcement or military members and they eventually work their way into profiling as a result of their own interest. Uh, as far as intelligence analysts and um, corrections analysts, that corrections is jails and, and prisons, um, those analysts are very often civilians. They may or may not have started out in a uniform position and moved their way into um, analysis most of them are, are in fact civilians and are hired specifically to do analysis for law enforcement much in the same way a business intelligence analyst does the same thing for business, you know, determining how businesses can grow, doing statistical studies and those sorts of things. 
crime scene techs um, are not what you see on television. Um, crime scene techs are generally people who have an interest in that field and uh, go into that field specifically intending to make a career of it in law enforcement. Uh, most states do not require them to be certified law enforcement officers. Some do, most do not. All require some form of training. And the mar majority of them accept BFI's crime scene tech as, as uh, courses being the necessary familiarization course for that state. But, you know, it's a state-by-state -state situation. And we take phone calls from the various uh, law enforcement certification agencies asking us what is the curriculum. And uh, there is a very specific form that we fill out and send in for those agencies so that our, our certifications are recognized. It's a standard practice for people that conduct law enforcement training of any, any sort. Uh, but being that we have a couple of folks on our staff who are former post staff members, we know how to move through that process and answer the questions that, that post may have. Do standards for these positions vary by state? Yes, to our knowledge, there is not a single state that is certifying criminal profilers right now. That is one of the, or national intelligence profilers, that is one of the reasons BFI and NPA was formed, was because we do need, um, we do need certification in this field. When I first became involved in law enforcement certification back about, I think it was 1980, the only certification in my particular state was peace officer certification. Now there's, uh, in that same state, there's jail certification, correctional officer certification, crime scene certification, um, a, a wide variety, 911 dispatcher certification. Uh, so certification programs are formed, uh, then they become normalized, and then they become accepted. And so for profiling and intelligence analysts, we're very much in the forming phase. Uh, it'll probably take us a year or two to begin for this certification to sort of get out there. As you guys graduate, people become aware of you. And we will be giving uh, talks at various uh, large law enforcement associations. Um, uh, we'll try to speak at the International Association, Chiefs of Police, National Sheriff Association, some of these other associations, and make law enforcement aware that this program is in existence, which makes you more hireable. I'm not sure hireable is a word, but we'll go with it today. Uh, what is law enforcement certification? Well, uh, that's a pretty good question. Law enforcement certification is licensing. In every state in the United States, uh, you must complete a certification process, a hiring process. That is, you have to be a certain age, usually 21. You have to not have a criminal record, uh, show a pattern of disregard for the law, uh, you must pass a physical fitness test, psychological evaluation, and in some states a polygraph, a lie detector, if you will. Um, so that's the pre-certification process. Once you've had that background investigation and, and jumped through all of those various hoops, the next step is that uh, you go to the police academy. Once you graduate from the police academy, you're either recognized as certified by that state, and there's a state or two that require you first to do some field training officer training. You have to have a little time on the road. But so far as I know, every state in the United States requires you to be certified before you complete a year of law enforcement uh, employment. So uh, it's a good idea to, to have even these types of certifications early because as your competitors are going through, meaning your peers who are looking for a job just like you are, as they're going through this process, most of them are not going to have any certifications. Uh, you will have some certifications, especially if you take multiple certifications at BFI. Are students guaranteed a job once they graduate from BFI? No, I, I wish we could guarantee you that, but we can't. We take phone calls constantly from people asking us to, from agencies asking us to help find and recruit profilers or analysts, but we cannot guarantee you a position. The reason for that is that there's too many variables associated with you as a person your peer group, those you're competing against, the agency, and the various laws. Um, so for example, you may do great in our courses, um, but you may have a history of traffic infractions. You know, you, you've been arrested or you've been cited 10 times for reckless driving. Uh, we'll just make up a silly example. 
that may be a disqualifier in that law enforcement agency. You may do great on your background investigation, do great with us, pass your polygraph, but when you sit for your interview, you just don't impress the, um, the recruiter that's talking to you, the training officer that's talking to you. Fortunately, that's one thing we can help you with at BFI. Uh, we, we're really committed to helping you find a position. And if you're having some problems getting hired, then, then please drop me an email. Let's set up a, an appointment to talk, and let's talk about what particular problems you ran into and how we might be able to mitigate them because there's waivers of problems sometimes. Uh, maybe you need to tweak your interview style. We can do that over a Skype session or two. You know, I'll sit, sit or somebody else on the staff will sit as, a, as an interviewer and we'll interview you and we'll tell you what your strengths or weaknesses are. We'll give you some tips. Uh, I've been a law enforcement leader myself. I was a police academy director. Uh, I've been a hiring authority. Uh, we understand what the agencies are looking for and we want to help you get there but we can't guarantee you a job. We just don't know all of the things about you and your background, and we don't know the expectations of the agency you may be applying for. You know, obviously, uh, a uh, potential hire a candidate for LAPD, Los Angeles Police Department, is going to hire, uh, is going to face a very different set of hiring circumstances than uh, a potential candidate in some small department in Texas or Mississippi that's got five or six officers. Um, so it can be very different. And then of course the recruiters, the trainers, and the executives of that agency's personalities come into play too. That's yet another variable. So you, you know it's like any other job, but there's a lot more requirements and a lot more standards. Uh, are there different levels of law enforcement training in their profession? I guess that means in law enforcement training profession. And if so, what are they? Yeah, there's, there's different types of training. The first level of training is called basic training. That's your basic police academy. Uh, exactly how long those police academies are and how they're conducted varies greatly by state, according to state standards and state culture. Uh, you know, if you get in a big uh, inner city police department where you've got a certain type of population, I, I can remember a department I used to work for that we had an entire, uh, this was not, too terribly long after the Vietnam War, but we had a, we had two very um, distinct populations of uh, folks from Vietnam and Laos. They, Laos, they were two different communities. They were close to each other in geographical proximity, uh, but we had some very significant language challenges at first when those communities became established. We had to learn their culture. They had to learn ours uh, until they assimilated into the American way of life. So, um, you know, those types of things are considered uh, in a ba basic police academy. The second level of training is called in-service training. Uh, every state requires that officers undergo in-service training each year. That's just training. Usually it's 40 to 80 hours per state, and that's just training that re keeps your skills sharp. So that's, you know, making sure your CPR is, uh, certification, first aid certification, your fire, firearms qualification, all of those sorts of things are kept up to date. Uh, so that's, that's annual training. The next level of training is intermediate training. This is the training that you need to do your job uh, as a law enforcement officer or national intelligence um, analyst, depending on, on where you are in your career. Um, those are the things that, that help you do your job better. You've already established yourself. You've got basic training under your belt. Perhaps you've taken a year or two of in-service. Intermediate training is, let's say, for example, you decide you want to be on the SWAT team. You may take a SWAT course, or you want to be a hostage negotiator. And, and very often, uh, you should know uh, profilers are very often hostage negotiators because they understand human behavior. Uh, or you want to become a homicide detective. These are the sorts of classes that fall into the intermediate level. Then there's the advanced level. Advanced level courses are just that. Uh, maybe you've taken basic homicide detective course in your particular state as an intermediate course, and then you go back and you take homicide detective level or homicide investigator level two. That might be your investor or advanced SWAT. Uh, the next level is management supervision. Uh, supervi excuse me, supervisor and manager. Supervisor is typically a sergeant or a lieutenant. That's your training on how to be a corporal sergeant or lieutenant. Uh, manager tends to be a lieutenant, captain, and major. An executive or command college is your chiefs and assistant chiefs. Okay. Uh, everybody at BFI, by the way, on the faculty is, is at least um, 
a manager level. Most of us are executive command college level. Uh, and most of us have both military command college level as well as law enforcement command college level. Uh, what is the basic police academy like? It depends on your state. Um, but you're not going to go into the basic police academy and be recognized as either a profiler, an analyst, or a crime scene technician. You're going to go in and be recognized as a recruit. Some states use a very military type of training. My academy did. Uh, we used a Marine Corps format uh, in our training. Other states uh, are more laid back. Um, in, in our particular state, we had regional academies, and it was up to the director, so long as they met the state post standards, what the tempo and the, the culture was like in that academy. Uh, I ran my academy in a military type way, while I had peers who very much were collegiate in atmosphere. Um, does it help for a profiler to have military experience? If you're going to be a national defense intelligence profiler, yes. Uh, because you, you need to know how to move around the military system. Does that mean you have to have active duty experience? No. Uh, you could certainly join the, the Guard or the Reserve and get your intelligence training that way to get your foot in the door. Uh, and as soon as you come out of that intelligence school, you can apply for defense contracting jobs. You may not be able to start as a profiler right away, but uh, once you get in and you start working a country desk or something to that effect, and your boss learns that profiling is where your heart lies, uh, pretty soon he or she will almost always assign you to begin working the human and cultural behavior side of things. Occasionally, too, I should mention to you that profilers work economic considerations. Uh, they'll look at a culture and say, hey, this is, this is what they're likely to do economically. This is how the Internet's changing their way of life, changing the way that the current younger generation thinks and acts and that sort of thing. So profiling is a pretty, pretty wide field. Do profilers face security concerns in their careers? Yes, they do, absolutely. Uh, we don't tend to be very public in our profession. Uh, that presents some real challenges at BFI. Uh, some of our potential candidates want to know why they can't read all about us on the Internet. Well, if, if you're reading on, all about a profiler on the Internet, Unless he's just or she's at a police department and they're content with that being out there, it doesn't matter too much in law enforcement, but in national defense intelligence it matters a great deal. Uh, if, those, if those profilers are out there in the public flashing their information all over the Internet, they've got some potential problems, uh, security problems. In fact, most profilers do not even have a social media presence, um, and some military services don't allow uh, their profilers to have, and some intelligence services don't allow their, their people to have social media presence. Uh, so that's a real challenge for us at BFI to, to share our credentials but not risk our security and our family's security. It's not hard to track down uh, somebody once you see them on the Internet. Uh, I assume profiling might not be the right job for everybody. Am I correct? Absolutely. Uh, we, we've had a couple of folks that have come into BFI that just um, clearly should never have approached us. Um, they had some unrealistic expectations of a school of other human beings. They had communication skills that were so, uh, so base that they couldn't talk to other people. Uh, you have to have a little bit of sophistication about yourself. That doesn't mean you have to be arrogant or you have to have money or anything like that. It means you have to be compassionate towards other people. You have to have empathy. You have to be insightful. And there's some people that just aren't that way. You know, there's some people that like to be uh, isolationists, uh, who are antisocial, who have mental illnesses. Um, who just don't have patience. It takes a lot of patience to be a profiler. You have to dig into a lot of detail. Uh, and again, as we talk about profiling, keep in mind that, that I'm speaking from the viewpoint of operational behavior profiling as opposed to just crime scene profiling. And I don't use that just in the term of denigrating crime scene profiling. They're, they're just different. Um, would it help for a BFI student to also become a reserve police officer? We get that question quite a bit, and absolutely it would. If, if you're going to school and you're also attending BFI 
or you're currently unemployed and have a little time on your hands or you're single right now and haven't started a family so nobody's going to be upset if you stay up late at night and work weird hours and those sorts of things it would be ideal to become a reserve police officer because as you go through your courses and you gain your training from both your college and bfi then you can show the department you have a unique skill set and very often that turns into a position for you the typical police chief or sheriff does not think of a profiler every day it's not something that comes to his or her mind constantly they think of profilers when other investigative procedures and techniques don't work then they may approach the fbi or their state uh, investigative uh, agency depends on where you are uh, texas bureau of investigation or whatever um, and ask for help then uh, it doesn't dawn on them to have their own profile profiler and you may be able to, to convince them of that and show them that need through your own work as a reserve officer uh, there have been times in my career when my primary duty has been military or national defense and i've also worked as a reservist i've i've always maintained in my own career a dual track of being a military reservist with an emphasis on my civilian career uh, as a law enforcement officer or those roles have been reversed for example 9 11 happened then all of a sudden I found myself extracted from law enforcement and placed into national defense intelligence uh, right, right away. Um, do new profiles, these questions, by the way, are just in the order that we pulled them out of the, the emails, so there's no particular order. Do new profilers, analysts, or crime scene techs face any background investigations? Yes. If you're going to enter either the law enforcement field or national defense intelligence, you are going to uh, face a background investigation. Uh, that's just part of the process if if you want to be in national intelligence you're going to have to have a security clearance and that is a very in-depth background investigation if you have specific questions on that give us uh, a call drop us an email we'll be happy to answer the questions that relate to you personally and we'll keep them confidential believe me you're not going to ask us anything we haven't heard before uh, why might a potential profiler analyst or crime scene tech be rejected from employment most common cause is a felony conviction or a pattern of disregard for the law. A pattern of disregard for the law is when you break the law in small ways and do it a lot. Okay? So remember that little silly example of, of 10 reckless driving citations I used a few minutes ago? That's a pattern of disregard for the law. So uh, if you have uh, in your college years, let, let's say you're 24, 25 years old, you attended a couple years of college and you were in a fraternity and you frequently went out and uh, drank underage, um, under the age of 21, but over the age of 18, well, you're not in the juvenile world anymore then, are you, once you hit that age of 18, so that record's not sealed. Uh, and you've got five or six uh, arrests for drinking underage or uh, <laughs> urinating in public you know the things that go on when college kids are young and having fun uh, and that cause interaction with law enforcement those types of things that show a pattern of disregard can cause you to be rejected the good news is that if you're 24 years old and you did those things three years ago you know when you were 21 or more than that in the case of drinking underage but you get my point after a little time goes by those sort of are mitigated by the changes you've made to your life there is not a person in law enforcement or national defense intelligence who has not had mistakes in their life bad times or made a misjudgment me included we've all done it uh, time doesn't heal all wounds but it certainly makes it easier for law enforcement to absorb them on your behalf uh, there are some things that will never be uh, accepted if you've engaged in domestic violence in the united states you're not going to be allowed to carry a weapon in law enforcement that's just the way it is you know you if that's your problem then you may want to talk to an attorney and see if you uh, uh, can get a pardon or, or something to that effect uh, but there are some things like that you know sex offenses that just are permanent mark on your record um, doesn't keep you from being in non-uniform law enforcement work 
uh, but that's an agency by agency matter and I can't really address that for you in, in much detail. It depends on your locale. Our security clearance is required for profilers and analysts. Uh, in national defense intelligence, yes, uh, absolutely yes. I don't know of any intelligence analysts that don't require security clearance, regardless of military service or, or civilian intelligence service. Um, that goes for profilers as well because they are analysts first. Uh, as far as law enforcement, no, your background investigation, your hiring background investigation is your profile, uh, excuse me, is your um, clearance. Are there special considerations for the families of profilers? Absolutely. Let's take, for example, the case of a counter-narcotics profiler. And let's say that profiler works for the Drug Enforcement Administration, a national agency. Uh, that profiler is going to travel. He's going to leave the United States. She's going to go uh, to places that normally you might not want your family to go. Not always the case, but certainly is the case sometimes. So, you know, the moving around associated with being a defense intelligence profiler or a federal profiler is a consideration. Uh, the need to keep your family safe because intelligence people, law enforcement people are targeted by the unsavory aspects of our society. You have to be aware of that. I was once a SWAT commander and had threats against my children uh, when they were in elementary school and uh, we had to put special precautions in on their behalf at school. That was in a SWAT role, not a profiling role. But nonetheless, those sorts of things can happen depending upon the cases that you're working. You said BFI does not require college degrees for enrollment. Should students pursue a university education anyway? Absolutely. Not only does a university education provide edification, that is, it grows your mind, but it also shows a degree of discipline. It shows that you're willing to get in there and stick something out, whether it's comfortable for you or not. It allows you to hear other viewpoints and it exposes you to diversity in the population. Those are all key characteristics for a profiler. Uh, there's no reason you can't do both. Uh, I, I went to my criminal justice program, undergraduate program, in the 1970s under a program called LEAP, the Law Enforcement Assistance Program. That program doesn't exist anymore, but it paid my way through school. At the same time, I was a military reservist. I was a Marine, just off active duty. I had a young family uh, and, you know, several other things going on in life, plus working a part-time job because, hey, that's just the way life was back then and is for many of us now. Um, so going to school definitely enhances your chances of getting where you want to be as a profiler. Um, if you take your BFI classes, earn your certification, and go to work in law enforcement or the intelligence field, you will get to where you want to be with these certifications, provided that you continue to read and study. Profiling is not something that you learn once and then leave it. It's a very perishable skill set. Um, so a university degree and the growth that comes with a university degree is helpful. Mm -hmm. It teaches you research skills, it teaches you writing skills, and all of those things matter if you want this to be your full-time career. This being profiling I'm speaking primarily to. Intelligence analysis is no different. If you want to be an analyst, it helps to have good writing and speaking skills. You're going to be briefing people that are very senior to you in, in your and their profession and you need to come across as polished, which is probably the word I should have used earlier instead of uh, sophistication. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes with time and experience. Uh, one of the things that you do in an intelligence school, um, at least the one I attended, is almost every day we had to build a briefing and we would come in very early in the morning and build a PowerPoint briefing and then we had to make that presentation. Uh, talking to you today, uh, I have questions written down but I don't have notes. Uh, I have to be able to sit here and convey this information to you in such a way that you understand it. And that's despite whatever personal idiosyncrasies I may have, my voice being too low or my vocabulary being limited or too many hand gestures, uh, those sorts of things. So school helps you build those presentation schools, get you used to talking to an audience, helps you learn to research, makes you appreciate reading, keeps you abreast of technology. You know, all of those things matter. And in a perfect world, every profiler would have a PhD, but the world's not perfect and we can't all afford PhDs. Um, can BFI students earn college credit? Not yet. We're working on that uh, several times in the past. 
uh, working in police academies for posts and so forth. I worked on endeavors where law enforcement training received college credit, military training received college credit, and we are in the process of working that now. Uh, we're trying to do it in such a way that that credit crosses state lines and is not restricted to any one state. So that's going to take a little while, but I think probably within the next year you'll see that you will get college credit at most colleges for this course. However, that also means we have to make this course more intense. We can't offer you a 160-hour course and expect a college to give you a year's worth of credit. That's not how criminology programs, criminal justice programs work. Uh, they're more involved, they're more intense, and they have more specific standards. We have to get a lot more interaction from our students in these programs, for example. This video, the video prior to this one, were, as I said, talking head videos, that's not the type of um, uh, exposure to education that proves that you know what you're absorbing. So we will be adding exams and papers and projects and group projects to the program, which will bring us more in line with college expectations. Uh, but right now we need to get through the, uh, the pilot program. And one of the good things I'll tell you about that, the, f the future is, let's say that you complete two programs and the programs become more sophisticated over the next couple of years, you will be able as an alumni to go back and look at any new course we develop and take that course. So you sort of got a lifetime license, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so if you see that we develop a course on serial killers two years from now that wasn't there when you came through the program and you want to go back and take that course for credit or not, then you'll have an alumni number and you'll just be able to go in and take that program. We are uh, bringing a learning platform on board. Uh, if you're in class one, you've seen that class 1532, you've seen this in the email. If you're in future classes, this will have already been established, but we're bringing an online pro, uh, platform, learning platform on board called Moodle. It's an open source platform that is used by a lot of universities. Uh, we've been working on that for the last several days, um, just about a week. Uh, that will be coming up uh, soon, be going active soon. We'll be launching that. And for alumni to take those newly developed classes, you'll have that permanent alumni number and you'll be able to go back in Moodle and just surf and see what's there that applies to you. Uh, and perhaps you can come back and be an instructor. We'd love that. Um, Lost my place here. What makes a potential profiler analyst or tech really stand out in the hiring process? We mentioned certifications. I mentioned certifications that they, um, they definitely make you stand out because they show that you are willing to act and not just talk about your interest. Those go a long way on a resume, uh, especially when you can provide actual copies of your diploma. Membership in NPA shows that you have a real interest in law enforcement. Your ability to conduct a good interview, as we discussed, we'll happily work with you on that, if you, especially if you've got an interview coming up. If you're going through the process and you know that you have an interview coming up in a week or two, please feel free to give us a call and we'll run through a role playing exercise with you two or three times to help you polish your presentation. Uh, your ability to, to speak to the point. Uh, law enforcement and, and intelligence work, uh, while detail is necessary to provide foundation, uh, they, we really like an analyst or profiler who can present what's called a bluff statement. Bluff, B-L-U-F, bottom line up front. Can you get right to the point? I, in my own career, not that my career is perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but in my own career, I've made it a habit if I'm asked a question to always answer that question very directly, immediately, and then come behind my answer and explain it. Uh, you'll find that will serve you very well in an interview process. And I learned that from people who went before me. You know, those, those little types of tips of the trade, if you will, tricks of the trade, will, uh, will help you. Uh, so you want to go and you want your resume to be professionally, uh, professional in appearance. You want some depth. Uh, to be clear, you want to show that you have an appreciation for individual people, sort of a holistic approach to life. You know that all people have value. You want to show that you have an interest in cultural diversity. You have sound judgment. All of those things can come through in the interview, and we're more than happy to help you 
uh, with that role playing exercise. So please take advantage of that. And if you've got an interview coming up and you're one of our students and you want to do a role, ex role playing exercise, we'll drop something else we've got going on to come to you to serve you. Okay, so that's, that's my personal pledge to you. It's hard to get that interview. We don't want that interview to, to be the reason you didn't get hired. I understand that, that you founded a practice called intelligence profiling or operational behavior profiling. What is different about that model and what we typically see on TV? Um, most of the, I don't watch profiling TV shows, so I don't know very much about um, some of the things that are referred to me, some of the programs that are referred to me or um, made reference to me. Operational behavior profiling is very practical. It's intelligence based. It's about uh, predicting what bad guys are going to do mitigating surprise, intervening before bad guys can do things that they intend to do, making them move and communicate. We talked a little bit about that in uh, session one. Uh, but most of the profiling that I imagine you see on TV has to do with crime scenes. Uh, and that's the traditional purview of, uh, of law enforcement. Um, and that's why we made it a point to include Mr. Turvey's text as one of your recommended readings in course one so that you could see that difference between what I presented to you about operational behavior profiling and what um, you would have seen following that behavioral sciences unit from the FBI's process. Mm -hmm. They're complementary, they work very well together, but they are different. Uh, I've applied for and even been interviewed for law enforcement or defense contracting jobs but never got called back. What could I have done wrong and what might I do different? I think we've covered that. Um, it could be your interview, it could be a background problem. Uh, we talked about helping you out with role playing for interviews, but another thing we might do for you is we're happy to review your resume. We won't write it for you. Uh, we don't have time to write everybody's interview, but we'll certainly review you, your resume for you, tell you your strengths and weaknesses and make some recommendations. One question that we get quite frequently, and I used to get at the police academy, is should I have my resume professionally uh, designed and developed? I personally, this is my view, I don't think it is worth that money um, because you can convey your point without spending thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars. I don't know how much it costs to design a resume. Uh, we, can, we can help you with that. And if, if I get emails from four or five of you that have seen this video and you say, hey, we'd like a, a resume building class, I'm happy to help you with that. I'll put, put together a tape like this that won't be required watching, uh, but we'll get before a whiteboard and actually line out some stuff for you. But I, I will promise you as a service of BFI that we will review your resume and your transcripts and so, such for that and tell you where, such as that I meant, uh, and tell you where you might beef up your credentials a little bit. When I was young, I had a misdemeanor arrest. Does that preclude me from government services? Service, um, and no not if it's the one or two or, or maybe even three. It's a state-by-state state standard, but it also depends on what the nature of that arrest was, um, and especially if a little time's gone by. Um, one of the big considerations is how people talk about you in your background investigation and your letters of reference. Who are they from? How much weight do they carry? Like everything else, law enforcement has some po politics to it. If you have some political connections in your community, by all means, use them. You know, if your family has been friends with a judge for years and he retired uh, and he's no longer on the bench so he's allowed to write a reference letter, by all means pursue that. That can help provide some counterweight to that problem you had. I smoked weed a long time ago. Okay, can I still work in law enforcement? Depends on how long ago that time was. Because if you smoke enough weed, well, maybe a long time is not what you think it was. Um, yeah, if you know, if you go, if you go take your urinalysis and your background investigation, and you fail it because you smoked weed, well, you're not going to be hired. Um, if you fail the polygraph because you lie about smoking marijuana, then you're not going to be hired. Um, if you have used drugs in your past, you need to, and you're serious about being in this profession, you need to own up to that very early in the process. Save yourself a lot of heartache. Save the recruiters a lot of heartache and time. If you come across as sincere and remorseful over something that you've done wrong in your past, that normally goes a long way. Many agencies have a weighted system uh, where they assign plus and negative points to specific behaviors or specific occurrences, specific um, shortcomings or strengths. And sometimes this is you know, a point or five points or 10 points away from you 
uh, and sometimes it's plus points because you admitted it up front. The, uh, a general rule of thumb is always admit it up front, never let it be discovered. And if you have friends in law enforcement, then you can call and talk to them or you know, go have lunch with them and talk to them about your problem and see how that might be regarded in your particular community. And you can ask us. We, again, you're not going to ask us anything we haven't heard. I used to be a post-certification division director, um, also a police academy director. I've dealt with a lot of recruits in my career. Uh, don't be ashamed. We're not going to hold anything against you at BFI. We're not going to say, oh, you're out of the program or anything like that. We're here to help you call us and tell us your particular problem, and we'll try to help you mitigate that. We won't help you lie, but we will help you put the best face on the problem that you possibly can. I'm employed in the mental health profession currently. How do I break into law enforcement? Um, very often there's, a, there's sort of a weird disconnect between law enforcement and mental health. And profilers, um, not so much intelligence analysts or crime scene techs, but profilers sort of have a foot in both of these fields, as you can well imagine. Sometimes mental health professionals think cops are too strict, and sometimes cops think mental health professionals are do-gooders. Um, who don't really accomplish anything because they just want to do ther uh, therapy. Excuse me. Um, if I was already in the mental health profession, working as a therapist, working as a um, assistant to a psychologist or a psychiatrist somewhere, and I'd been doing it for a few years, this is the ideal case to become a reserve officer uh, and begin to apply your skills in that um, in that field. It would be very easy to go into your criminal investigation division commander and say, hey, I'm, I'm one of your reservists, but I'm a mental health professional. I have a real interest in profiling. I've taken some courses through this place called the Behavior Forensics Institute. Here's my certificate. I, I really want to develop. This is my profession. Can I provide you some of these services on a contract basis or free? If you say contract basis, you'll get a maybe. A free, you'll get almost definitely a yes. Um, and I say almost definitely, which is a contradiction in terms because you never can tell the personality of that person that's in that job. You know, they just may be somebody who's against anything forward thinking. Um, but your, your average investigation team is very interested in having a profiler on board. Um, does my age matter for employment or certification? It, minimum age of 18 in many states, mostly 21. Uh, state agencies, and federal agencies tend to want you to be able to put in sufficient time to retire at age 55 and still receive a pension. Uh, so age does matter in some ways. Uh, the flip side of that is if you go to work for an agency and you've got a few uh, years on you that prohibit you from making that 55 point pension cutoff, uh, you can just simply go into a non-sworn position and be a profiler in a non-sworn capacity. Sworn officers swear an oath carry a badge, certified, non-sworn personnel do not carry a badge, non-sworn, usually non-certified. I'm currently working on my degree. What classes enhance my chances of being hired and what suggestions do you have for me to start my career? The, the classes that, uh, the concentrations, the majors that law enforcement is interested in right now, especially federal law enforcement, are fairly different from the time when I was a, a young uh, rookie. The focus now is on white collar crime. Profiling can fall into that white collar crime realm. You can be a profiler that does nothing but white collar crime criminals. Um, uh, foreign language for obvious reasons and accounting, forensics accounting, forensics computer work, those sorts of things. Uh, but if you specifically want to be a profiler, uh, then your, your uh, education needs to reflect that. You need to pull the right courses. You know, if you're going for your, let's say, master's in psychology, then don't concentrate on childhood uh, therapy. You know, child development matters because, well, you're going to be working with juveniles. Uh, but child therapy, child support groups, not so much. So just use a little common sense there. Um, get you a couple of textbooks on criminal profiling and just look at the table of contents and the index and sort of match key words to what classes are available at your school for the particular semester that you're um, enjoying or enduring, depending upon your point of view. 
Are there other organizations I should join to enhance my employability? Certainly. I would recommend always watching the International Association of Chiefs of Police, even though you're not a police chief or not going to be one in the near future. They have a lot of resources on their page. National Sheriff's Association is the same way. Uh, you can look into speci uh, specific organizations that, that cater to your interest. Um, you can look into, for example, victim witness organizations. Uh, I, would, uh, I would certainly consider joining some of your state law enforcement as associations, even though you're not yet in law enforcement. You can join as associate member uh, or a corporate member. They have different names for them, but it's a, it's a non-sworn member of that association. And the good thing about that membership is it gets you their newsletter, their magazines, and you can see what's going on in your community or the community you're interested in. If you live in Nevada and you want to work in Pennsylvania, then subscribe to associations uh, or join associations that are in uh, Pennsylvania so that you're getting their reading material. And very often that's the place to find the positions that you're interested in, a profiler position or a detective position, wh whatever may apply to you. Don't expect miracles. Uh, if you don't have any training, you're not going to be hired as a profiler. Keep it real. Um, keep your expectations real. You won't be disappointed. But on the other hand, don't take no for an answer. Um, what should I be researching or reading? I would read everything you can lay your hand on about profiling or intelligence analysis, uh, analysis or crime scene investigation. Uh, keep an eye on uh, a good clearinghouse site like Amazon. Uh, maybe once a week research by keywords the titles to the, to the topics you're interested in. Um, perhaps active shooters or school shootings or behavioral profiling or crime scene technology. Uh, you should once a month do just a general Google and Bing search uh, related to trends in the profession that you're interested in. What's new? What's developing? Um, I had a, a candidate last week that contacted me and said that he had looked at our website and that he had decided he would not join because BFI was new and the certificate would be worthless. Why should he join anything new? And, you know, my response to him was, I, I can remember not too long back, it's not that far back in, in history, when blood splatter analysis was laughed at. And people said, this will never be a science. This will never be an investigative tool. Now there's certifications in blood splatter analysis all over the country. I can remember when the same thing was said about DNA. I remember, a, uh, in fact, a psychiatrist telling me that DNA investigation, investigative techniques, and DNA technology were pseudoscience, ghost science, he called it. They would, it would never be valuable. Um, the possibility to get gunpowder residue off hands uh, was at one point laughed at. All of those things were new at one point. Uh, laser systems to test firearms, uh, qualification skills and police judgment. That was made fun of in its day and it's now out there as, as a firearms certification or the, typically used in police academies. Um, so everything has a starting point and you are on the cutting edge here. Some of the existing profilers will say, hey, you know, this BFI thing, they should never invi invite people from the general public into it. We should never invite street level cops to it. By the way, Class 1532 has a number of current police officers and detectives and, and uh, intelligence analysts in this class. Um, for others, your future classes, your classes probably will as well. Uh, so everything has a starting point and this is the starting point for profiling. There is no other profiling certification program in the United States. Uh, I need help with my law enforcement or defense resume. Any suggestions? We've covered that. We're happy to help you there. Does BFI handle job placement? Yes. BFI, one reason of BFI being founded was because we were frequently, as profilers, being asked to help find new profilers. Uh, we placed just a few uh, in our first few weeks of operation. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's probably what brought you to us. Or we placed an ad uh, to find some, cer some certified or some recognized profilers um, throughout the United States. We didn't have much luck. There's not people out there that have this, this training that's just 
there's no formal courses. And we're going to correct that, and the courses are going to become more intense and more stringent. Will BFI help me build an employment package? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. One uh, consideration that we've been exploring here at B BFI is that there is a real problem with police recruiting right now and intelligence uh, analyst recruiting. In the case of law enforcement, the situations in Baltimore, Ferguson, um, threats from terror groups against uh, military members and law enforcement members have, have all made police recruiting become more and more difficult. And we are considering starting a por portfolio service. Uh, I alluded to this in the early comments on this video. And what that service will do is, uh, if, we, if we do proceed with it, is we will hire a contract background investigator, uh, profiler, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, psychologist for your, your psych exam, uh, and a polygrapher so that we can put that package together and put a roster together and law enforcement agencies can come directly to us and hire people who have already gone through the initial steps. Doesn't mean they won't still want to do their own work, but if you hire a uh, law enforcement analyst from uh, BFI's roster and you're a recruiter, you know that at least an initial background investigation has been passed and that saves money and time for the agency and, and time for the potential hire as well. So we're looking into that now. We, we're talking to a number of police departments about the logic of, of that service and so far it's being met with positive response. But frankly, right now we need to get the training nailed down correctly, uh, the profiling uh, core curriculum determined. We need to learn from you as pilot courses and then we'll, we'll move on to that uh, next or after next. Uh, it is, is it important for me to network? How do I do so? A absolutely networking is important for profilers and analysts and crime scene techs just like it is for everybody else. One way to accomplish that networking is through NPA which is going to become much more active over the next few months uh, especially as they absorb ISHTA which we think they will and we uh, will make introductions, cross introductions for you. If you're uh, we have a couple of BFI students that are shining already, and I would not hesitate to go to some of the peers I've worked with over the years who are in ISHTA and say, this is somebody that it would be worth it for you to hire, uh, maybe as an HVI targeteer in some, HVI is high value individual, uh, enemy targeteer in some national defense agency, uh, intelligence agency, we'd suggest you hire this person, it's worth it for you to get them through the security clearance process. Um, so that's an example of networking. Uh, being involved in committees that the NPA puts together, being involved in studies uh, that NPA does, working internships through NPA where you have senior people that uh, are using you as their assistant, if you will. Those are all good ways to network and just keep your eyes on the NPA website. It's going to uh, be reworked. It's gonna look quite a bit different in the in coming weeks and it's going to begin offering you more and more services. Frankly, we've just got our hands full. We could spend all day, every day, in both organizations just answering the phones and questions. Um, I, if I want to be a criminal profiler, must I start out as a street cop or patrol officer? Usually, yes, that's how the agencies hire if the profiler is sworn. If the profiler is not sworn, then no. Um, but. Uh, again, a reserve, being a reserve officer is an ideal way to get your foot in that door. You get the training. Uh, there's a variety of different types of police academies. You can go to a full-time academy, which is you're hired by the agency and the agency sends you that academy, or you can pay your own way through an academy in some states at a community college or what's called a civilian police academy. Uh, but be careful about that term. Civilian police academy is sometimes just an academy that acquaints the public with police work and so it may be about two weeks long and you walk out and you're just familiar with law enforcement that's not what you want you ultimately want to be certified um, so you know if you have questions about an academy send us an email send us a link and we'll talk to you about it uh, would you please tell me what it is like to work as a profiler every day I mean what is the job really like you'll have more cases than you can work uh, if anybody ever finds that you've got downtime, they'll quickly fill up that downtime. The work is very detailed. There's a lot of writing. 
there's a lot of briefings. There's a lot of reading. You'll, you'll have to read a great deal of material about either your subject or your type of subject or the crime your subject has committed or whatever activity is involved in, depending upon what prof type of profiler you are. Um, you'll spend a tremendous amount of time on the computer. Uh, if you're lucky, you've got other people just like you that work around you, so you can ha experience analyst crosstalk every day, which is where you sit down and you share ideas and strengths and weaknesses of cases and approaches and those sorts of things. What it's not is, it's not like it's portrayed on TV where you're constantly uh, the hero that everybody uh, walks up to and pats you on the back in some ways. It's a, it's a bit thankless, but that's the nature of public service anyway. Uh, if you think that you're going to get an attaboy every day, you, you're not. Um, uh, the flip side of that is the work is intensely interesting and it's intensely gratifying. Um, no two days are ever alike. Uh, and you grow. You grow constantly because you're always learning uh, different ways that people express their behaviors, uh, different cultures, those sorts of things. So it's a constant growth profession. And every profiler I've ever known or HBI targeteer I've ever known is a person who really wants to grow constantly. They're lifelong learners. And they, they tend to go to school a lot, not necessarily just a university, but they'll take a lot of courses. Um, if they see that a particular investigative technique to help them solve a case, they'll go take a class on that technique so they know more about it for the next time. So it's extremely interesting work, and if it's classified, you can't talk about it at all. So uh, again, that's one of the dilemmas we have as a faculty here, sharing our cases with you. How do police chiefs, sheriffs, and senior int intelligence leaders typically view profilers? Um, some embrace us, and some make fun of us. That's just the reality. I had a sheriff recently who made a great deal of uh, mockery of my work and my type of work, what people like us did. We did a case for him free. He laughed at it as we were doing it. Our investigative techniques were silly and so forth and so on. And then the subject was apprehended and the subject met 90% of the criteria and uh, substance and information that we provided, investigative leads we provided to that sheriff. Um, one would like to think that that sheriff stood up and said, hey, you guys were right and I was wrong. He, he didn't. He just ignored us. Um, so you've got some of those sorts of people, but those are rare. Uh, most police chiefs and, and senior intelligence leaders now know the value of profiling, so we don't get many of those types of individuals like that particular sheriff. Uh, but it is frustrating when you do hit those folks. Uh, what does profiler caseload mean? Uh, caseload is how many cases you're, you're working in a particular time period, per month, per day, whatever. Um, so you may be working uh, a case of an individual in a foreign country who is involved in white collar crime using the internet and at the same, and you're trying to profile him on behalf of a white collar crime investigative team. At the same time, you're working a uh, serial child molester. Uh, so you have these conflicting case, li case loads moving, and you have to learn very quick how to prioritize. Sometimes your boss prioritizes them for you because the public has prioritized them for them. Um, so that's, uh, that's case load, and we'll talk about building case files as we go further into this course, uh, or this program, not this particular course. What is corrections intelligence analysis? Analysis corrections is prisons and jails. It involves the, uh, the analysis of intelligence information gained through studying the behavior of inmates and inmate populations. It's very valuable in prisons, especially regarding gangs, prison gangs. Uh, many prison gangs conduct business, uh, gang members conduct business from prison just like they were still on the street. And our last question, can I really make a career of profiling or law enforcement intelligence analysis? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I've been at it for decades. Many just like me have. Uh, there are different flavors of profilers as we talked about in course one. But yes, you know, you will have to pay your dues. You may have to become a reserve officer or be a street officer for a little while or become a national defense in, uh, intelligence uh, analyst working a particular country or a particular problem set or a per particular technology before you get to this point, but you just have to stick with it and you'll succeed. 
I've seen it happen many, many times in my own career. Our entire faculty and staff is made up of people who have been successful at it. It is a very rewarding career, uh, but you do have to pay your dues. You do have to get your, get your certifications, uh, whether it's B BFI or other types of certifications. You do have to learn to know what you're talking about. You do have to work on your writing skills. If you can't write, you can't present cases. You have to work on courtroom demeanor and testimony, which we'll help you with. Um, you have to get your resume right to even be hired. You have to get your interview right to even be hired. Uh, but those are, the, those are the gaps we're trying to close for you. So uh, in closing, I'll mention a few little things that are going on. I mentioned Moodle, uh, getting that online platform up. We should have that up for you very, very soon. It's rather utilitarian in appearance. It's not fancy, uh, but it does everything a university um, online program needs to do and uh, so we're, we're learning it and we'll help you learn it and soon you'll have improved quality of content and access uh, and you'll also have individualized login and student emails and all of those sorts of things. Uh, we'll be adding a library and resources link uh, in the next few days to, uh, let's, let me manage that expectation, in the next week to two weeks to the uh, BFI course so that we can start putting resources out there for you so as you can afford it you can begin building your personal library and also accessing articles that we'll keep online. Uh, in my most recent email to you I mentioned that we are getting the artwork finished so that we can begin selling uh, apparel. Some of you have asked about that. Um, we're not going to sell that stuff but it's some tremendous markup. We're not interested in making money from the store. Uh, this is something that, that students have asked for. And then very soon we're going to put up a job portal where we will start posting jobs and trying to ma help you match up to your career aspirations and learn about the process before you actually go through it. And that jobs portal will we'll try to put up some resume writing tips, maybe, maybe get a, an online resume maker and, uh, and also uh, some interview tips and those sorts of things that you typically might see. Um, so that concludes our session today. It's been a bit long, longer than I intended, but you had 50 questions, and so we answered 50 questions. Uh, if you have any more, send them to me in email. And uh, course three uh, will be up soon. We hope that course will be presented in the Moodle format, and we'll let you know when it's online. And uh, uh, hopefully we all have exciting days ahead. Let us know what we can do for you. We're here for you. I'm Russell Baker. Good day.